Welcome to uh, COVID Update, COVID Town Hall. Um, we have uh, four presenters today. I'll introduce people briefly. Dr. Philip Chang um, is new to UHCMC. Dr. Chang was the Chief Medical Officer at University of Kentucky. I almost said University of Louisville. I don't know if that would have been controversial or not. A little and, bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, was uh, was recruited um, to join join the UH team. Dr. Strosecker, who was our CMO, became our COO, and there was a search and um, uh, for a few months. And, and Dr. Chang was recruited. And shortly after he got here, he uh, he faced a pandemic. So God bless you, uh, Philip. Uh, his background is, is is trauma surgery and was the CMO at, at uh, University of Kentucky for several years. And he'll be our first speaker. Uh, make a few a few comments, and then we have our. Um, our, you know, our COVID all-stars. So Dr. Furin, who is the ID founder of Team C, um, Dr. Sade, who is infection control and uh, been very involved, and Dr. Hajal, who is the critical care. All of them have been working tirelessly for the last month and great participants in our conferences. So I, uh, Philip, I'll give you the floor. I think Matt's going to... He is screen shared, so... Your screen, your, your, your content. Go ahead and share your con your content, Philip, if you want to, and I'll give you the floor. Should I mute this? Mute this? Okay, it's not allowing me to share, um, so I don't know if we can work on that. But um, while we're working on that, I'll just talk through it. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and um, really appreciate the opportunity. And I want to make very, make it very clear: I did not bring COVID with me, um, as some might have implied. Not that not you, uh, Dr. Armitage. Um, <laughs> But uh, I did come right w along the time. I've been tracking this with interest, um, particularly back in January, uh, I guess it's December when, when China shut down Wuhan. And I quickly looked up on email uh, how big Wuhan was, and I said, holy cow, it's bigger than New York City. So I think, as we all say, the rest is history since, uh, oh, good, now I can share my screen. I want to share a few things with you. So shortly after um, we started looking um, we started responding to COVID. We um, we have formed uh, an incident command center. Um, the way it's structured, as, many, as some of you may already know, uh, is that um, uh, each hospital forms its own command structure, and we all report up to Unified Command, which is set up in CSC. Uh, the incident, incident command structure at CMC has been up and running physically for two to three weeks. Uh, for the last two weeks, it's been a seven-day-a-week operation. On weekends, there's probably not as much going on, so we just make rounds on the ward and make sure uh, we answer people's questions. Uh, a couple of things that we have not done, but certainly on our plate, are uh, town hall meetings. Uh, every time we want, we, we plan to do one, we seem to run into a system town hall, so we try not to do two back-to-back. -back. And the other thing that a lot of people have asked for is a daily dashboard, uh, which we are working on releasing. There's some information some people deem sensitive, and um, but um, personally, I would just like to share whatever we have. What's on the screen for you right now is basically, and we have data dating farther back than that, but there are basically, uh, these are all admitted inpatient, uh, COVID positive inpatients, and uh, if, we can go. We have data farther back than March and March 21st, but it's zeros and ones and twos. Um, uh, it's not as meaningful. So we just started tracking March 21st, and um, the the uh, blue line are ICU patients day by day. The the red line are floor patients, and then the gray line is um, is basically um, two numbers added together. Very simple math, very simple graph, but what you will see is that for the last week or so, we've just been sort of floating around 20. Yeah, we got as high as 22, 23, I think one day, a uh, couple of days, we got as high as 23, and then it sort of tapered off. So we're watching this reasonably closely. Um, we, we hope that some of the national models are true and that we are, in fact, at our peak or about to pass our peak, and that this is all we're going to see. However, I will say that um, the main threat right now, if you will, um, is are coming from um, small outbreaks, and I put small in quotes, 
small outbreaks in nursing homes, small outbreaks in, um, say, a prison, um, or potentially small outbreak in a large apartment building. And these small outbreaks, if they happen one at a time, I am pretty sure UH and the city of Cleveland can handle it just fine. But if you have multiple outbreaks tracking at the same time, uh, it, could, it could cause some trouble. The, the other thing I want to show you before you get to the really learned people here uh, is this thing that we've been working on. So in response to multiple requests, the system requests UH, um, the, um, the region, Ohio Department of Health, and even the National Guard, everybody wants to know if we had to turn um, a field house into a hospital ward, is UH ready to do it? And some of you may know that a neighboring hospital has done something like that. Um, my old institution, I think, is building one in the in the stadium. Um, but but what we what we test ourselves, and we've been working on this with a lot of help from uh, Department of Medicine, of course, um, is is a challenge to say, okay, if we had to search to 300% of the total number of beds, what does that look like? Um, what do we do? Which beds do we use? Can we actually do it? Um, and when we get to all the way to the right, status black, status purple, um, what do those, um, what does the care model look like from a nursing standpoint, from a respiratory standpoint? So this, unfortunately, this document is not quite complete, so I want to show you what we have uh, and walk you through this in the next couple, three minutes. So status screen really is just, at the end of status screen, we've, uh, we've utilized every single available physical bed in this institution, and that's roughly the breakdown minus rainbow. As some of you may know, Rainbow Children has been designated as the um, the only pediatric hospital if we do search the p uh, pediatric patients from other neighboring hospitals, uh, Cleveland Clinic and Metro Health will come to UH. So they're not part of our search plan for that reason. <clears throat> uh, we go to yellow um, and the, the goal on the percentage, these are arbitrary. Um, to be completely honest, Pharma did, Pharma did it first, and we just follow them. So we follow their percentage, that way the system is consistent and reach into 300%. You could really debate whether that's the right way to surge or not. And in fact, the spread of the coronavirus is not going to follow our numbers. So we could very well be orange in ICU and yellow in acute care and vice versa, who knows, but at least we have a plan. So this is sort of the summary page. Um, I, I just want to give you a quick glimpse of um, what the process was. So what we did was we looked at every unit and the black, the black numbers are non-COVID. And as you see, we, when we go from um, green to yellow, we have to turn basically all of Learner Tower to COVID. Um, we kept Simon basically non-COVID the entire time. Um, and then we went into details like this. Um, so for instance, um, we have things like when we have 30 combined ICU COVID patients, we transition to status yellow. And, and we went further into the weeds. Uh, and this is for good reason, because in the middle of the night, this is the playbook we're gonna, cover, we're gonna follow. So it went into detail like this. When open CTICU as a secondary COVID unit when CICU has 75%. So CICU houses, as you know, 20 patients. This past weekend, we actually hit 15 beds and we started the, the discussion of vacating CT patients. And as you, and there, there's some issues, issues there. There are two lung transplant patients, there's an ECMO patient, et cetera. Where do they go? But at least we had a playbook and we gave ourselves a little bit of a cushion so we can start thinking about that. Fortunately, when we hit 15 beds, we quickly realized that there are three patients who have orders to go to the floor. 
so we did not have to execute this plan. But it goes through that level of detail. Um, and then there's their logistic, logistics problem uh, issues. Do we have enough pump, poles, suction regulators, suction spoilers? And Dr. Hajal's team, oh, sorry, wrong spreadsheet. So there's a separate spreadsheet um, for ICU physicians and a separate spreadsheet that um, Dr. Little Keith has uh, and, and company, uh, Kristen Welch and a number of uh, Peter have all helped us put together. And, and part of what they did, and they can probably show, show this better than, than I do, I just did the summary here, is how many day teams are we going to need? And as you see here, we quickly go to 27 teams and probably need a lot more. Uh, and we're, we're sort of ironing out the details here. Um, but in all honesty, we do need to be ready for 300% surge, uh, certainly on paper and should have a plan. But um, based on the first spreadsheet that I showed, um, I'm very optimistic that, that we should be no more than yellow to be, at best. So with that, I will stop here um, and uh, I'll answer some questions if that's the format. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Philip. And uh, for the rest of our speakers, we'll take questions at the end. And uh, Dr. Chang is going to run to a meeting. So if anybody has quick questions, one thing I'll comment, you know, I know senior leaders are looking at a number of models, and the University of Washington model was kind of an outlier that predicted a, a small surge last week. And the other model is predicting a higher surge in a couple weeks. And for now, you know, knock on wood, sacrifice a chicken, blah, blah, blah. It seems like the University of Washington model is winning the day. So I know everyone's planning for the massive surge, and Dr. Chang has led the effort here at UHCMC. You know, he mentioned our, our chief residents who have been helping him fill in the details on teams. They've been really fantastic. Um, any, other, uh, any other questions? Matt, Matt's here trying to control the, the uh, presentation. I'm going to say for the, for the rest of the presentations, people can duck halo questions to Peter Sarek and Kristen Welch. And you can email questions to me in Outlook. I'll be on my computer. And um, I want to thank Philip. Philip's super busy, but I thought it would be a chance to, to introduce Philip you know, to the Department of Medicine because not everyone knows him. And he's been you know, running, running the surge planning behind the scenes. It's been an enormous effort. Because we, we think about it in terms of medical teams, which is a really big effort when we talk about Nurses, respiratory therapists, um, you know, uh, uh, transport, you know, meals. All, it's really a huge, a huge operation. Anyway, um, and thank you, Philip. We'll move on. So, Jennifer Furin, uh, who's been here before and is the, the Team C founder, and um, and uh, lots of international experience. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for allowing me some time uh, to speak with you all. And um, thanks, Dr. Chang, and to everyone at Incident Command for all the hard work you're doing. Uh, I have to say it's always a pleasure for me to be able to have some time um, to talk uh, here. Um, I've been really impressed and amazed with what the medicine teams have done. Um, first of all, taking excellent, excellent care of patients um, and, and um, our patients are getting the best care, I think, in the world, but um, for, you know, all the other little fires that you put out on a daily basis. Um, I did want to let audience members at home know we, we can see you, um, so it's great because there's a little interaction there, but if you don't want everyone to see what you're up to, you may want to turn your video off. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, sort of the typical presentations of COVID versus what I call the interesting presentations of COVID and how this sort of affects our approach on Team C. And I'm really glad to see my colleagues, Barb Gripsover and Leila Hojat here, who are the other two Team C attendings, and our fellow uh, Brandon Twardy, who's uh, here in the audience, as well as uh, other folks, um, and they can chime in uh, on the clinical management side. But I was taught, and I did my medical training in Boston, that if you hear hoofbeats, Think of horses, not zebras. Now, I spend a lot of time in South Africa these days, so it's not always necessarily true. But I think it's an adage that has served us well in our medical practice. Many of us want to be elegant clinicians. We're at a tertiary referral center. So we often do think along the lines of zebras. But I think as with anything, going back to our first basic principles during the COVID uh, pandemic can, can really help us all. But I'm afraid, you know, what COVID's done is it's given us a very new perspective of what a horse is, what a zebra is, and, you know, what is this strange creature before us? Um, and um, I like to have a little humor in my talk, so it kind of makes it a little bit easier uh, for me and hopefully for you as well. COVID has
yeah, those questioning are very basic. Like, this looks to me like a donkey that's been painted with zebra stripes, but, you know, maybe we're wrong. Maybe it is a zebra. Maybe it's a horse. And, and that's why I think going back to first principles becomes very important. So I want to talk a little bit about the data that we have on common presentations in people with COVID-19. I want to discuss a little bit some of the interesting or rare presentations of COVID-19 to talk then about the biases that, that happen with all this kind of literature, but particularly when case report literature is published, and then to discuss our approach here at UH in the setting of limited resources. Again, this is new for many of you. You always have the resources you want. If you don't have them, if you yell loud enough, you'll get them, but we really are in a period of limited resources with COVID. So where do the data on the classic findings come from? They largely come from our colleagues in China. Um, there have been multiple cohorts from China that have been published in highly rated peer-reviewed journals. Um, but these were largely retrospective analyses among people who had a diagnosis of COVID-19, usually in the hospital, um, and they went back and looked at the presenting symptoms that people had. Um, they report on the symptoms, and there's also a couple of reports in the literature on some of the radiographic findings, but there may be a bias in all these, right? China had better access to testing, but the Chinese also were the first to have this happen before we even knew what it was and what it was called. So there may be some biases in who we're seeing in the Chinese cohorts. Um, and then other countries who are facing large outbreaks don't have time to publish their literature. So you'll see little things squeaking out, like seven people from an ICU in Italy. But we generally tend not to include those in some of the more classic findings because it's a highly biased group. There's biases everywhere. We can't stop them, we just need to know what to do about them uh, and how to interpret them. But this was a case uh, series that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine of 1,099 patients from 552 hospitals in China. The most common symptoms were fever, 43.8% on admission, and 88.7% at some point during hospitalization. And then cough was also a common presenting sign, 67.8% uh, of patients. Diarrhea happened, but it was uncommon. Um, and diarrhea almost always occurred with other symptoms, so it wasn't isolated diarrhea usually. Um, and then 83.2% of patients had lymphopenia, and they also had a common CRP elevation. So these were associated findings. We don't know actually how predictive they were of COVID, uh, and this will be one thing that's interesting to go back and do. Like we've been very focused on our neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is predicting poor outcomes. I wonder if we looked at non-COVID patients how many of them would have an NLR greater than three as well. So these are just things to keep in mind. Um, another um, clinical case report series from China that was published in the Lancet looked at 99 patients from one hospital in China. So again, one hospital, there may be some biases in terms of who got admitted there. Um, but what they found, fever, again, 83% of patients, cough in 82%, shortness of breath, 31%, myalgias, 11%, confusion, 9%, headache, et cetera. And 90% had more than one sign or symptom. So if someone's coming in with diarrhea alone, it's probably not COVID, okay? Uh, and we have to think about other things. In terms of radiographic findings, there are some classic radiology findings. And I have to say our colleagues in the Department of Radiology, I think, have done an excellent job responding to how the imaging can help us. We've had a couple of patients who tested negative for COVID who had very classic radiographic findings. And They've done a great job flagging it. In the early days, they were like, cannot rule out COVID, which wasn't helpful. But I think like all of us, they've learned in the past month um, and have been very, very helpful. Um, so among these 81 hospitalized patients in Wuhan, 79% had bilateral ground glass opacities. They were more often seen in the periphery and more often seen in the right lower lobe. Okay. Um, a majority of them with worsening symptoms progressed from these bilateral ground glass opacities to frank consolidations. So it also depends on CT findings where you get people in the course of disease. Um, and I think that's, yeah, there are, again, other case reports that come out, but those, these are the main cohorts that have been uh, published in peer-reviewed journals. So in terms of case reports, we love case reports, right? They're interesting, okay? Their goal, they keep us vigilant, right? Don't forget, it could present like this. But they are usually not common findings and people with COVID, and that's why they get published, right? It's like saying, I want to find zebras. Where's the best place to go look for zebras? Look at the case reports coming out on COVID. Those are zebras aplenty. Um, but a lot of the case reports aren't peer-reviewed. 
Okay, and this statement came out from the New England Journal, and I've never seen them put anything out like this ever before. But they're publishing case reports, and they say, to rapidly communicate information on the global clinical effort against COVID, the journal has initiated a series of case reports that offer important teaching points or novel findings. Okay, the case reports should be viewed as observations rather than recommendations for evaluation or treatment. And these reports are not evaluated through their standard peer review process. And this is a balance they have to find. But what happens is the New England Journal usually comes out on Thursday. There are some interesting case reports. And on Friday, Team C is inundated with requests for testing. Um, and so we have to remember these are, they're being published because they're not common and they're not typical. Um, so this happened last week. There was a case report of three patients uh, in China who developed coagulopathy. Uh, in the setting of COVID-19, um, they had significant coagulopathy, antiphospholipid antibodies, and multiple infarcts. And this is from one ICU in China. This isn't surprising given that the ACE receptors are located on the endothelium. Most of the patients have highly elevated D-dimers and both micro and macro clotting. But this is published because it's unusual. Okay, what happened um, is that all of a sudden everyone wanted to test anyone who had a clot for COVID-19. Um, and this led to a significant amount of consternation, frustration, fear. Um, and so when I think about how should we use these case reports in our clinical management, and again, Barb and Layla can chime in here, I think they can help us be aware of things. Like once we knew about this clotting, we talked about different strategies to anticoagulate our patients who have COVID, okay, which I think is very appropriate. We're seeing people with D-dimers of like 30,000. Okay, but they shouldn't be generalized to the population. If anyone with a clot should be tested for COVID, and that's what a lot of people wanted to do. Um, so in general, people who come in who have another reason for clotting, probably not every pregnant woman who rolls through Mac House with a DVT needs to be tested for COVID. Okay, and I think it's just important because that, that donkey painted like a zebra looks like a real zebra. Uh, from our perspectives when in fact it's just, it's, it's not. And so we always have to go back to our basic principles. Um, and part of the reason I want to mention it is we've seen some dangerous things happen when people are overly tested for COVID. Right? Someone says it could be COVID, they go to a unit that may not necessarily be prepared to provide them with the care they need, procedures may be delayed. And so we all have to sort of remember case reports are interesting but they shouldn't determine how we test. So our clinical approach to the COVID zebras are that in the setting of limited testing, which we are in, and PPE, we have to move beyond our thinking of, oh my gosh, could this potentially be COVID, more into thinking of this syndrome seems like it's COVID, right? So anyone who comes in with a DVT, unless they have fever, cough, diarrhea, other things, we really shouldn't be thinking about COVID for them. And then remember the basics of our clinical training. If a patient can't give a history, do what we usually do when a patient can't give a history, right? There's been a lot of angst about testing all people who come in who are found down. Again, not a great strategy, not a great strategy. We have to go back to the, to the basics. Um, and then remember the things that caused these other odd clinical presentations before COVID was around. If a pregnant lady came in with a DVT, we didn't really push a whole lot more to find out why, because pregnant women are hypercoagulable. The unusual findings, again, don't generally occur on their own. They're usually part of a constellation uh, of presentations. But if there is an unusual presentation, like we had a young man with no risk factors for stroke who came in with a large right MPA stroke. He would had cough, fever, shortness of breath at home and had been exposed to a coworker with COVID. He got tested. But then we also had several calls about 79-year-olds who are smokers have, you know, multiple cardiac risk factors and a history of previous strokes, those people probably shouldn't get tested for COVID. So this is kind of the way that we're thinking through these things. It's not always right, and we're going to be wrong sometimes. But this is our approach right now. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention, because it's gotten a lot of attention this week, and it allows me to introduce the concept of a ghost zebra. <laughs> so can, can we make recommendations based on things that aren't there? Okay, the ghost zebra. And what happened this week, the IDSA issued their recommendations on the treatment of people with COVID-19. And basically they say, don't treat anyone unless they're enrolled in a clinical trial. Now, 
Should this change our clinical approach? One of the things that I think is important to understand, and then I promise I'll stop talking, how do we make guidelines? How does the IDSA make guidelines? Okay, they review available evidence. They have a committee that comes together. They review available evidence. They follow something called the grade process. But if there's no evidence for them to review, they cannot issue recommendations. Okay, this is nice when you're looking at better approaches to community-acquired pneumonia, and maybe 18 months from now, the IDSA will issue some guidelines based on evidence, but they can't issue a guideline when there's no evidence to review. So we are not changing our therapeutic strategy at UH. Most hospitals are not changing their therapeutic strategy based on the IDSA guidelines. So with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone for all your work in these strange and challenging times, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that come up at the end. Thank you. Fantastic, Jen. And um, as I said, we'll take questions. Um, Doc Hale or Peter or, or Kristen, or email me. I'll run and get my charger because my, my laptop's dead. Um, Ellis Day it was, had a kind of a quiet existence before there was COVID with his wife and children and doing infection control at UH, and now his life is not so quiet. All I know is that Ellie answers my emails at 6 a.m. I do not answer his emails at 10 p.m. So, yeah. <laughs> I answer emails at the crack of 8 p.m. Yeah. And then I go to bed at 8.15 anyway. Very impressed, yeah. All right. Hi. Um, so I, I'm going mainly to talk today about uh, uh, this continuing COVID-19 precautions. Uh, so kind of focusing on that, but I, I take as, you know, questions on anything. So these are like the CDC recommendations, which we are basically following or, you know, but we are being even more conservative than that. So the CDC recommends two approaches to, to discontinue precautions, either a test-based approach or a non-test-based approach. So in the test-based approach, they, uh, uh, so they require a, a patient to be at least uh, seven days uh, since uh, the start of his symptoms, of their symptoms, and at least uh, three days after the improvement of their symptoms, so mainly their respiratory symptoms, cough and shortness of breath. And then they need to have two negative test results, collected, PCR collected uh, more than 24 hours apart. That's kind of when we do a test. Uh, however, they also um, have a non-test-based strategy, basically three, day, uh, three days after our time base, so seven days since the start of the symptoms, three days since the improvement of the symptoms, and that's it, you can stop precautions. So uh, that's what the CDC recommends. A lot of people don't, I would say, don't think they, we, we want to be more strict or more, uh, especially in some situation, like for example, a patient is in the hospital, so they can, there's a risk of, of con contaminating healthcare workers or other patients. A patient is very immunosuppressed, uh, you know, or I say immune compromised. A patient is going to a long-term care facility, like a nursing home, because also there's a risk there. So those are the three examples they cite. You know, other similar example, maybe somebody who's going to get dialysis, for example. Uh, so uh, in this situation, they, kind of, they, they recommend or they suggest going more toward a non-test-based, or I'm sorry, going to a test-based strategy. One thing to pay attention to is they, they do say, like, for situations where you are clearing the patient for, you know, stopping precaution, even if you're stopping it at seven days. However, a lot of patients continue to cough, so they, they will have, like, a dry cough for a while. So they need to continue wearing a mask. And, again, this here is not really based on evidence. We don't have the luxury of having evidence now. So we're kind of shooting kind of from the hip you know, on a lot of these recommendations or being inspired by other infections or well, like SARS-1, uh, MERS, influenza, others. And uh, so they need to continue wearing a mask as long as they're coughing, but also 14 days since the start of their symptoms. So for inpatients, again, because these are higher stakes, uh, you know, situations where we don't want to infect healthcare workers, other patients, uh, so we're requiring a test-based strategy, at, and we are being, you know, much more conservative than the CDC. We are doing at, at 14 days. So we are asking, you know, to get the first test at 12 days, and then the second test can be done at 14 days, so we can, you know, be quote-unquote ready for the 14th day. 
but again, uh, again, this is you know, if the patient is positive, then what to do? Uh, the, you know, we don't really have much information about what to do then for inpatient. You know, uh, we don't really know if this positive test at 14 days is really uh, reflects, a, you know, live viruses or live variants that can, you know, induce infection or not. Uh, of course, everybody, you know, is being very conservative now, so, you know, we would continue precautions. Uh, and, uh, and the patient, of course, will continue to wear a mask if they're still coughing. So for outpatients, a little bit less conservative, you know, we're doing seven days, we're doing a non-test-based strategy. Um, you know, if somebody is immunocompromised, goes to dialysis, for example, you'd want to test them. You can do that at seven days, you know, again, with the improvement of symptoms and the afebrile for, uh, for three days. And they will need to continue wearing a mask when they're around others, also for 14 days total or, you know, until uh, they stop coughing. So for healthcare workers, again, again, healthcare workers are uh, considered, uh, you know, a higher stake population because of the factors mentioned. So the CDC recommends for healthcare worker either a non-test-based strategy, uh, or which means like a time-based strategy, and that seven days since the start of symptoms, not 14, seven. We are doing 14. We are going much more conservative. Uh, or they also recommend either this or a test-based strategy. So we're being, you know, overly conservative by doing a 14-day test-based strategy. Now the problem with that is that a lot of patients or a lot of healthcare workers are still testing positive at day 12, at day 14. And what do you do then? Uh, so that's kind of a conundrum. What we're doing now is we're still continuing to do testing. I mean, what, one way to do it is not to look, so not to test. So that's kind of, you know, that will still be consistent with the CDC. However, what we're doing right now, and that may change, is that if somebody is still positive, then we will say, okay, to come back, you know, if they're meeting all the other conditions, okay, to come back to work, but they will need to wear a mask for seven days after the test. Um, I mean, people are okay with it because everybody wants a mask today, so that's another reason to get a mask, appropriately, by the way. Uh, so for healthcare workers without symptoms or lab diagnosis, so they, you know, you can continue to work. So you have been exposed to a patient or a provider, you continue to work, you report it to the employee hotline, which you can email or call for documentation. Uh, you wear a mask uh, for 14 days, you check your temperature twice a day, you'll be alert for symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath mainly, which everybody I'm sure is. And if you have new symptoms, you can uh, uh, contact, uh, the, you need to contact the hotline. And, and, and here, you know, if you don't develop any symptoms, you just stop wearing the mask for 14 days. But again, you know, we are wearing masks anyways, most of the time. All right, any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, questions are for the end, no questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Zoe, that was awesome. And I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll get a lot of questions. Yeah. I have several. <laughs> and uh, Professora, Professora Dr. Herjal, who uh, the Cincinnati Inquirer did a study on critical care doctors and use your picture. It was awesome. <laughs> and we've been sharing that over social media. Oh, so, uh, Thanks. Um, well, um, today, today I decided to talk, uh, to, to make some slides and not talk over off my head. Uh, for disclosure, uh, really this is what I know today, but tomorrow who knows what's going to happen because things are changing so fast that uh, uh, um, maybe what I'm saying today is not going to apply tomorrow. The, uh, there are, the one thing that I hate about this timing of all of this is everybody thinks of it as an opportunity to write something. And then they write something, they have a concept, concept in their head, it just applies, make a nice graph, publish it somewhere, and it becomes dogma. And then we have to, as clinicians, we have to make it to uh, follow what they have. Mm -hmm. I am certain that whatever talk you're going to see, you're going to see this pretty graph that was done by a few immunologists 
uh, in the Brigham, they, I have nothing against it, but it's a concept. It's not what you see at the bedside. What you see at the bedside is something like this. I'm not an artist, but there are three patterns that we have discovered or what we have observed in people who end up in the ICU. The first pattern is the hyperacute state, where somebody comes in sick, bunch of shortness of breath, bunch of hypoxia, and within hours they are in the ICU uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very bad way. What happens to them later depends on how you manage them. There's a group of them, people who start sick and then gradually they take their time and then all of a sudden they just kind of follow a certain path and within a couple of weeks, three weeks sometimes, they are back to their usual self. And then this is a group that has a biphasic uh, presentation. They are sick in the beginning, they kind of, uh, the, the, the severity of the illness varies, but they tend to be getting better on a regular basis and all of a sudden they uh, become very sick again and at that time, all the inflammatory markers that they have shoot up, oxygenation is in bad shape, they go into shock and, and often uh, die. So if we look at these people, in the beginning, again I tell you, everybody said, oh, this is ARDS, it's obvious, it's so ARDS. So let's go back to the definition of ARDS. The definition of ARDS, which I am certain that in the next few years is going to change because of COVID, they said that the disease starts within a week, like ARDS starts within a week of, of an event that has happened. Chest imaging shows bilateral opacity, that's very true. That is not explained by a collapsed lung or, uh, or uh, effusion. And the origin of the edema, because they labeled it as edema, is uh, uh, something that has nothing to do with cardiogenic disease, and it's all related to capillary leak that's occurring in the lung causing infiltrates that mimic pulmonary edema on the chest x And then in the latest definition, they divide it into based on the oxygenation requirement uh, into mild, moderate, and severe disease uh, <laughs> based on the uh, PA to FI2 ratio and based on the amount of PEEP that they have, that they are on. So, sorry, let's, let's, let's go back. So when you look at what, what's happening with COVID, is perhaps they are meeting the PAO2 to FI2 ratio, but in reality, the, the abnormalities on the chest films and the infiltrates that I are seeing in the lung are not related to what looks like pulmonary edema whatsoever. And the timing of the disease is surely not within a week of a certain onset. It can take up to like 10 days, even to 12 days for some people to get this sick and end up with such a problem. So uh, I, I know Jen uh, showed you like the findings, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm a chest doctor, so I have to show you an image. Uh, <laughs> this is actually one of our patients who came in, well, one of our early patients, actually this is the ECMO guy, <laughs> who, who came in as a transfer for ECMO, and you can see that in the, uh, we're going top to bottom here, uh, you see these ground glass opacities that vary in size, they take a subfloral uh, location predominantly with very few little lymph nodes in the, in the mediastinum. And uh, later on in the course, you have like, what looks like classic consolidation. I don't know if I can see an air bronchogram here or not, but that's the kind of pattern that you see. It's usually bilateral. If I didn't show you anything except for this image here, you would look at it and say, oh, it looks like uh, uh, like an organizing pneumonia because there's subpleural sparing. If I look at this area here, it's all ground glass changes that's occurring in the subpleural space. There is nothing, nothing specific about this from any other viral pneumonia or any other pneumonia for, 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 for what it is worth. You know, the thing is at this point in time, in this epidemic that we are in, you see something like this, you have to make sure that it is not COVID related. It could be related to cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, but cryptogenic, by definition, is cryptogenic, you know? Anyway, so these findings, by the way, you don't have to see on a CAT scan. You can see as bilateral infiltrates on chest X-rays are, are non-specific, but lately, the, and I really apologize for not having ultrasound to show you, you can see these things on an ultrasound, and you would be able to tell that 
there are evidence of bilateral infiltrate. You will see thickening of the pleura. You see subpleural consolidated areas. Uh, and you can say this is probably uh, uh, COVID-related in the setting of the right clinical scenario. I'm going to spend some time here. So at least, so I, I showed you that a disease that's not within a, I showed you a disease that is not within a week. It is not looking like pulmonary edema by CAT scan. What's happening physiologically as the cause of hypoxemia? There is a, uh, one of the great um, uh, mechanical ventilate, ventilation people in Italy by the name Gattinoni, who in the past couple of weeks have been describing what they've been seeing in Italy. And what they've been seeing is a process of two different kinds of patients, basically. If you look at the causes of hypoxemia, and I don't want to torture you with the five mechanisms by which hypoxemia occurs, one of them is related to, like in this disease in particular, is related to dysregulation of pulmonary perfusion. And that's what leads to ventilation perfusion mismatching. In this area also, they've been observing some microthrombi in the pulmonary vasculature, at least from some autopsy series that we're seeing. In the late stages, you might see pulmonary edema. So it depends on the pattern that you see the patient is. If this regulation of pulmonary circulation is what you're seeing predominantly, you're going to have a lung that has a normal elastance or a normal compliance, uh, sorry, a low elastance that is a normal compliance. The ventilation perfusion matching would be abnormal. Their, uh, their, their recruitment of a lung is low, and that's why everything is low, low, and he called it a phenotype L. If you see something like this, the last thing you can think about is ARDS, because ARDS is something that destroys the compliance of the lung. It makes it stiff by definition. In the, in the process where you have actually pulmonary edema, you will have high elastance. If you were to apply PEEP, you will recruit some alveoli, and there's a huge right to left chunk. And he named this phenotype H, based on everything is high, and the other one is everything is low. You can start here and end up here, and how you start here and end up here, depending on how you were treated for one, how the disease process is progressing, and whether you uh, injured yourself further by, by, by the way you are breathing. What you can do for this type is as you watch them, you will look at their tidal volume being very close to normal because they really don't have to work hard to breathe. They, the tidal volume is very low, and oxygen therapy by itself will suffice. What kind of oxygen therapy is usually the non-invasive stuff that we use? And self-proning, it seems to be effective in these situations as well. But if you are in a process where you have very poor lung compliance, or a very high elastance, mechanical ventilation is needed because at that time, the tidal volume cannot be normal anymore. It will be low, so the patient compensates by increasing the respiratory rate. And the higher the respiratory rate, they have to work harder to breathe because there's elastic forces that are preventing them from breathing well, so they have to work hard. When that happens, you have to assist them with the mechanical ventilation. So not everybody needs a mechanical ventilation for one. And if you, put, if you were to put somebody on a mechanical ventilation, not everybody is going to require too much pee. So the original, early in March, they were talking about, oh, ventilator, high peep, ventilator, high peep. I think we destroyed a lot of people that way. But who am I to say? The, the, the problem is when you take that approach, you will injure the lung more. The, the ventilator is not a treatment. It's just a supportive tool. If you don't use it very well, you will induce lung injury to the point of no return. There is also a concept that is still to be uh, investigated a little bit further. There, there is a Chinese group that have looked at the hemoglobin moieties, and they figured out that this virus attaches to one of the uh, hemoglobin molecules, rendering it unable to uh, to carry oxygen. So oxygen carrying capacity dropped. And there are a few centers that are doing exchange transfusions. Whether that's working or not, I have no idea. And the one area that I really need to understand 
at this point is something called the neurotropism. It is believed that this virus somehow is affecting the uh, 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 midbrain, like pons and midbrain and medulla actually. Uh, uh, pons and, and, and there is a regulation of normality that occurs. This is why some people are presenting with cognitive abnormalities, uh, anosmia, and delirium. And more importantly, they have abnormalities in their cardiac, cardiopulmonary interactions. So some of them are bradycardic at presentations, some of them with a high fever don't mount a tachycardia, and some of them actually have sudden arrests for unknown reasons. So from a physiologic standpoint, this is what's happening. If that's the case, why are we so against oxygen? So a lot of people, again, this is myths and hearsay, and the biggest problem is now all the media talks about the science. And they have no idea what they're talking about, but they're driving everything, you know? So high flow oxygen, you talk to any respiratory therapy now, so you don't know, no, no, it's contraindicated, you can't do that because it's, uh, it's going to uh, create a big problem. So some people simulated it. So they put a high, in, a, in a simulation, they put a high flow oxygen and obviously some tracer that they're following across the room. And depending on the compliance of the lungs, they, uh, they, they had several scenarios, uh, mild to moderate severe with different flow of oxygen. And they looked at how far the air went out. And we're talking about 17 uh, uh, centimeters here, like this much. Um, definitely, at the higher, uh, uh, in, in the severer forms, you're going to have higher, uh, I'm sorry, in the normal forms, because you have normal compliance, you can shoot up as much as you can. But, but in, the, in the severe states, whatever the flow is, it's not too bad. They also looked at it um, uh, on CPAP, where at the higher pressures, you can tell that the distance that it travels is a bit longer. But it's far from being like six meters. So if somebody's in the room sitting doing nothing, this is just to support what Eli has been telling us all along. Uh, if you're far away from the patient and you're doing nothing, and the patient has, has, uh, has oxygen, nothing's going to reach you, you know? Moreover, so this is the device that we use. Some people decided to uh, radio label it and, and look at the velocity. And uh, without looking at, without going through the details of what they did, but this is the velocity of the gas as somebody is breathing in and out, with the highest velocities are obviously uh, around it all the time. You put a mask on their face, it becomes nothing. This is without a mask, this is with a mask. This is, I believe, with, with, uh, this is with the, with, with the uh, interflator. One of them is just with nasal cannula, and one of them is somebody just breathing. Now, if you put somebody on high flow oxygen, when can you tell they are going to fail or not fail is something that is important. A lot of people look at, say, work of breathing. And the work of breathing is not related only to respiratory rate. It is related to the respiratory rate, and it's related to the amount of muscles. It's related to the amount of muscles that you are using. So anyway, the ROX index is something that we can use, and we can talk about that at, at a later time. Options are to go back to physiology, apply mechanical ventilation as as well as you know it, monitoring plateau pressures, monitoring driving pressures, paralyze when necessary, particularly when people are uh, asynchronous with the ventilator. And, you know, all these rescue therapies are, are important, but always remember, this disease, you have to assess the ability of them to survive and involve palliative care earlier. Don't forget proning. This is our own nurses who devised this technique with sheets and whatever. It is the only thing that improves survival in patients with ARDS and perhaps with everything. I stop there. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Zhou. I, I stood up to... Um, and, and may, you, you want to take this? Because I'll, I'll field questions. Okay. I'll turn it on for you. Um, I stopped because I thought I wanted to leave time for questions. And, and we can stay beyond 1 o'clock if, if, if people have questions. And um, one of the questions I'll have, I'll ask our, our team C. You know, the New England Journal came out and said 
no, therapy, no therapies without being in a clinical trial. But I think you all are making decisions, and you have some anecdotal experience in some therapies, and it seems like it's a moral dilemma. And, and so I don't know. It sounds like you guys are reconciling that by if, if, you, if you think in your clinical judgment, based on what you know, based upon your clinical experience to date, you, you may not be able to follow the, the IDSA. Is that a fair? Yeah, so this Come on. is. And so, again, I think it's understanding how these bigger bodies make recommendations, right? They, they can't, we do this all the time in TB, where I spend most of my time. They have to have evidence to review, otherwise it's just expert opinion. So, um, at this point, we talk to colleagues at other hospitals to see what they're doing, and we feel our approach is quite reasonable. Now, there, there can be a downside to some of these medications. We've had several patients who've had to stop hydroxychloroquine because of QT prolongation, but we feel that they're in a very closely monitored setting, and so maybe at the end it'll turn out we're treating ourselves, yeah. um, but we do feel that we're going to continue to offer this therapy, as are many of our colleagues. Uh, understanding the IDSA, what else could they have said? Right, right, right. There was nothing they could say because there isn't really much of an evidence base for them to review. So, right. and Barb there's, there's and Layla, yeah, please. Yep. I'll hold it for you, Barb. Oh, I just wanted to add in. I do when I talk to patients, though, tell them that this is, that that this is, we don't know if it'll help. We do, we think it shouldn't hurt. We will watch her heart monitor, but it hasn't been proven out. So I do um, share that with the patient before we do it. So. Yeah, and several patients, know. Yeah. yeah, some patients will, will decline it, so. Yeah. And what about the IL-6 inhibitors and, and the really sick patients? You guys have some anecdotal experience. I know anecdotal experience is dangerous in medicine, but what's your... Yeah, we've and, and given... Dr. Zell, Nessa Yeah, we've given tocilizumab to three patients. Um, all of them are, one of them is, two of them are home and doing well. One just came off the ventilator today. It's... Yeah, it's a so, tough call. So the reason why it works well so far is because we're very selective on who to give it to yeah. and make sure they're not infected before we give it to because there's a possibility of superimposed uh, infections in these people, and that's where paying attention to detail yeah. is extremely important. But, but as a clinician, when you see have that kind of anecdotal experience, it's hard to follow the IDSA guidelines, right, if you think a patient's going to benefit. So and, anyway, I, yeah, we feel that other practitioners in the field are important sources of support for us. The idea is there was nothing else they could have said. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. There was just yeah. nothing they could have said. Yeah. So. But but I can say something, please. <laughs> you see what you were emphasizing the importance of clinical medicine. I was emphasizing the importance of physiology. We are back to the basics. Yeah. But everybody wants to put everything in a guideline and we follow blindly and which is not the right thing to do. We're just going backwards to really think. Yeah. Awesome. What the concept? Okay. Dr. Hart, I want to uh, just say one quick thing. Just, uh, yeah, quickly. I mean, I think all of us want to be in clinical trials for all of these drugs, and it yeah. just, it's not, we're fortunate that we have what we have the um, in terms of research, but yeah. I mean, it's just not realistic for, for every drug and for every institution. So. Yeah. Awesome. Got a question from the audience over here as well. Bringing the microphone to you. One second. Sorry to go back to protocol, but um, I was wondering for prior to procedures, if a patient's asymptomatic, do we have a protocol? Like, if we have to test someone before broad? We 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 do have protocols with an S for 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 testing, depending on the procedures, and it's way too detailed to go into. And right now, especially, I mean, if we say in two words, it's high risk procedures with high-risk uh, exp uh, exposures, and we do have protocols, and they're going to uh, evolve because of you know, better availability of testing. I mean, one reason people like LA has been incredibly busy for the last five weeks is all these questions come up. Like questions that come up, patients been in the hospital, and it's been more than 14 days since they tested positive, and the most recent recommendation, and again, this is, you're looking to the CDC, looking at other groups, but now patients can come out of isolation if, they're, if it's been more than 14 days, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of that will need a little bit more details, as, yeah. you know, as we saw. I mean, we, so all these are reasonable questions. We are getting questions like, is there a protocol for pens that go into the patient room? Are there protocols for shoes? No, we don't have protocols for shoes or pens, and I don't think we need those. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, everybody is hyper aware, but, but yeah. But, but Common sense. But, but. Do I have 
Yeah. Yeah. So at least from the clinical side, so Team C is available to try to help guide people through this. In the absence of symptoms, we do not recommend testing. Or if they've had a known exposure, you know, you take a careful history, but just coming in for a routine bronch in the absence of symptoms or an exposure, we would not recommend routine testing. The, uh, the bronch suite have changed their uh, attire because it's a high-risk procedure, because you have no idea what it is. They decrease the number of people in the room for one, and the person who's doing the procedure will have uh, a mask and a shield and would be dressed for the occasion, I guess. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we've got a lot of questions on Doc Halo. We'll try to answer uh, as many as we can. Um, we have one from Dr. Welch here. This is a question that came up earlier. Is, does UH have any guidelines or guidance on anticoagulation in COVID-positive patients? Well, uh, and our grand rounds in two weeks, I know which is an eternity in this, in this outbreak, is going to be on, on that topic, and Dr. Carmen is going to come. That's April 24th. And other, and Ron and, and, and a bunch of people answer my email. But Dr. Joe, Yala. This morning, this morning in particular, I was in a shooting match. <laughs> fresh from the we, Fresh. We, we agreed to a kind of 80% of the protocol. Um, uh, we put a protocol earlier from the ICU based on what we're th is thinking, but uh, it was very narrow minded because I was only thinking of the ICU. We have to make it a little bit more universal and has to be applicable to everybody, really, depending on their weight and whatever and whatever. So we actually have a very nice protocol that will go into the steps of how to evaluate somebody with a coagulopathy in, in, in particular, because all have been reported, by the way, in, in the hematology world. So we will look for DIC first, we look for DVT second. If they are not present, then we guide it by how high the D-dimer is and the weight of the patient is and the renal function, we will give you a recipe. This is to be uh, given out sometime this week. Great. Another question from uh, Doc Halo. Uh, so the recommendation to, to not treat outside of a clinical trial is understandable from a public health perspective. Uh, and obviously we have uh, some trials underway here at UH. Uh, what about for patients that are in hospitals that don't have clinical trials running? Yeah, so this is a great point. And again, this is where, as Rana said, we have to use our clinical judgment. So guidelines are only as good as the evidence that goes into them. I think we're so used to saying, well, the IDSA says this and the ATS says that. We are in a situation where no one can issue any guidance on treatment because there's no evidence for them to review. This is a limitation of guidelines, and I've spent a lot of my life working on international guidelines for TB. Sorry, and this comes up all the time. You can't have a normative body make a guideline without evidence to review. So in the absence of that, if there's no trial is available, we do still believe, or if someone doesn't want to be in a trial, in fully informing the patient, as Barb said, making sure that they know what we're offering them and then monitoring them closely. And everyone that we've talked to across the country is taking the same approach. However, if you're in Japan, you take what the president there says, which is antiviral F, and over here you take yeah. what your president says. And the, actually, the guidelines did, did answer this question specifically, and they said they acknowledge that you know everybody does doesn't have access to research, but they recommend to keep records and to share you know the data or the information. And there are so quite a few contribute. there's quite a few hydroxychloroquine trials going around. So, including Dr. Rodriguez is trying to do one here through the AIDS clinical trial unit enrolling healthier outpatients, and so there's a lot. That's another trial that we're trying to get going here at UH. Another topic. Go ahead, Peter. Just one other quick comment on this. So when you think about how we learn, people who are enrolled in trials are not always, sorry, oh, I'm not sure not sorry, that. They're not always enrolled in People who are enrolled in trials are not always the patients that we're treating, right? So there's always room for observational data. Um, because many people who we are tasked to care for don't fit into a clinical trial. They don't, they're not, they're too sick, et cetera. So there's always room, even with randomized controlled trials, for good observational data. So. And our clinical trial here is remdesivir. That's right. And, uh, and then, it, like it, it always said in Japan, there's this other antiviral. Pevapiravir. Pevapiravir that they're crazy about. And, and they're, it, it's their version of hydroxychloroquine with their president, yeah. So. Also own stock. Yeah. So we'll, we'll continue with the Doc Halo questions. Again, a lot of questions. I, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but uh, we'll try to get through. Um, question about some of the testing that's available. 
Is there any information about different sensitivities of the rapid test versus kind of the previous test that we were using? Any data on that? So um, the, the information on test sensitivity is very limited. There's not really a head-to-head -head comparison. There's multiple sources for, you know, for information, including the companies and other groups. So, um, you know, the range is very broad, uh, starting at 50% for some tests, going up to more than 90 but, you know, there's no head-to-head -head comparison, and there's not really a re reliable, uh, you know, comparison. There is one paper that, you know, tried to compare, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, they just took a very few of these tests, and it is very questionable also, their data. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Sade. Um, moving forward, so question actually for Dr. Uh, Hijal um, from one of our uh, attendings. So some ICU docs are noticing that many COVID patients have normal lung compliance. Um, what is our experience here? Uh, what's your opinion on likening this to something like altitude sickness, sickness where patients are hypoxic but their lung mechanics seem okay? I, I'm not sure it's the same disease, by the way. This, okay. I mean, this guy from New York, this doctor from New York saying, oh, it's like altitude sickness. I don't believe that that's the case. You do have abnormality. The, the compliance of the lung in a lot of these people are is normal. In our experience here, I only have an experience with 25 patients. I personally only took care of 10 of these 25 people. The, the ones that were on the ventilator, as they came to us, they were very advanced because we were taking care of them like days into the process. Last week, we had people that were just intubated, and I cannot tell you what, where we are. But the, 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 uh, the description of high altitude sickness, I'm not sure if that's the case or not. And the reason why they describe it that way is because the people are having hypoxia, but they don't feel it. You know, so they're, they're, they're going down and down, yet they're not really sensing it. They're talking normal. Everything is normal. And their tidal volume increases a little bit, but not necessarily their respiratory rate and definitely not their work of breathing. So that's why they're describing it that way. And that group of people, uh, it seems the use of high uh, uh, flow oxygen with self-proning without intubation is the way to go. Um, kind of a follow-up question for you, Dr. Hajal. Uh, what percentage, I guess, in your experience, I don't know if there's data on that. I'm only 25. Uh, <laughs> um, what percentage of, of these kind of MICU patients are meeting criteria for ARDS, would you say? <clears throat> I can't answer. Hard to answer. Okay. I, I, I mean, I was supposed to evaluate, but I fell asleep, and I'm sorry I didn't do it. No worries. Remember, <laughs> like, navi navigating our EMR is not an easy thing to do. Sure. Sorry. Good. Um, we'll continue. A couple more questions, I think. Yeah, sure. Um, do we know how long people can shed the virus after contracting it? Uh, not the incubation period, but I think we touched on a little bit about this with, with testing. Um, yeah, so that's the question. You know, I, I mean, the... the the highest length or the maximum I saw is, I think, 34 days, but I think that's just limited by the information we have, uh, that the information that's published. It's, and it's hard to know what the clinical significance but, is yeah. because the people mm -hmm. shed tiny amounts of virus. So, you know, there's a paper that came out, they can find tiny amounts of virus in the bottom of people's shoes. And, and it's totally unknown whether there's an infectious dose or there's a viable virus. So I think the, the molecular test is so sensitive in terms of an infectious dose, we just don't know if 34 days is, is a risk. Yeah, enough. I mean, we, we, we don't know if it's like a viable variant, viable whether this is something that's, you know, that's going to be contagious. So I, I, we're just talking about a positive test. Okay. Yeah. One okay. last question, and I'll make a closing comment. Great, yeah, so I've got one to finish us off. Kind of along those lines, uh, for patients who have a high clinical suspicion for COVID-19 but have an initial negative test, what is kind of the best time frame to retest that patient? Yeah, so um, we have had some experience with this um, in our patients. Sorry, Matt. I'm doing the microphone. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so um, we have had some limited experience with this. I'm looking at Barb and Layla. Uh, thanks, Rana. Um, and um, what we've done is we've tested them sort of every 24 hours. Um, we don't repeat multiple tests on the same day. Um, but we do have a small number of patients who clinically have the disease, but we're unable to prove it virologically. Um, so um, I think the most tests we've done has been three uh, because it was someone we wanted to try to get into a trial. And obviously they can't go into any of the trials, 
if uh, they are not positive for COVID-19, although we will still treat them according to our treatment right. protocols. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the approach. And, uh, and, and the key with the test is to apply Bayes' theorem. If your pretest probability is very low, a negative test probably means the disease is not there. If your pretest probability is very high, don't let, don't let a negative test dissuade yeah. you. And we've had several cases yep. that, that these guys have been involved in that were, that were like textbook COVID, nothing yep. else really fit, and they were negative repeatedly. Yeah, so, we um, roll them out. For, we give extensive workup for everything. And when the antibody test becomes available, these three patients will obviously be at the top of the list to get their antibodies tested. I think what we want to try to avoid, like one patient, they were really ramming hard to get the, um, the nasal oh. swab. Um, the lab is also mentioning there may be a time when we can test stool, so we may try to yep. get another source of uh, material, not just the nasopharyngeal swab. So and, and questions that, oh, sorry, Layla, do you? Yep. Right. So yeah. what Dr. Hojat said is, unless you're trying to get them in a trial or something, yeah. you may not need to retest. We are, there is a clinical COVID uh, disease. So. And, and two quick questions. Cool. Um, the antibody test, I think our hospital is not really, well, nationally, we're not really set up for widespread testing yet, but people who work in the lab are working on that. And that, that there's a lot of applications that we don't have time to talk about. Yeah. And we're also, the, our, of the hospitals here in our region are also working on the convalescent plasma um, which I think would be a promising therapy for some patients, maybe. So I'll just say, you know, I, I, I like everyone, I've been paying so close attention to this. And, and you know, early on I, I, I was, you know, a great admirer of, of Dr. Acton and, and Governor DeWine's, you know, response to her and his leadership and whether it made a difference. And it really seems like it has. And this is a statistic, and I see Scott Fulton's in audience from Detroit, that blew me away. As of this morning, there was 24 deaths from COVID disease in Cuyahoga County. In Detroit, there were 760, or in Wayne County. And, and, you know, there's lots that goes into this, but it really does seem like we're lucky in Ohio that our, our leaders intervened in the most effective initial response to this pandemic, which is social distancing, and it's probably more complicated. I think the statistic that makes the most difference in the end is the death per million population. And we'll see where we are. And, you know, our governor and our health director acted early, and we've – we appear to flatten the curve early. Of course, that's left us vulnerable because everyone's not immune. So, you know, story continues to unfold. We don't know that. What's that? We don't know that we're not immune. I mean, we don't know. And that's one of the things, again, the antibody test, one of the really good applications of the antibody test is, is to do population-based testing, assuming that we don't know for sure that having antibodies is protective. That's one of Dr. Atkins, I think, initial next strategies is to do population-based testing, get a sense of what proportion of Ohioans might have already been exposed and other strategies, and it's getting late. And uh, any, any last comments from our fantastic presenters? Keep up the amazing work. Congratulations to everybody. Yeah, and thank you for everybody who's seeing actual patients and putting yourself, you know, at risk. If there were any questions that we weren't able to get to and, and you'd like an answer, just please feel free to email myself or Kristen Welch, and we can direct them to the appropriate people for you guys. Thank you so much.